Ah, the 1980s. What a time. It was a golden age of homelessness, AIDS, drug addiction, and anti-drug hysteria. That's a fun combination, huh? But there were good things, too. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the space shuttle, not that one, some great Springsteen albums, The River, Nebraska, Born in the USA, Tunnel of Love, all examples of the boss working at the top of his form. It was a good decade for Star Trek, too. Some great Star Trek movies came out in the 1980s. Star Trek II, Star Trek III, Star Trek IV. Perhaps most importantly of all, it was the decade when the Star Trek franchise laid the groundwork for its future by returning to TV in the form of a brand new show, centered on a cast of brand new characters. It was bold. It was risky. It was... Not great for the first couple of years, but it paid off in the long run and transformed Star Trek from a series into a franchise. That show, of course, was Star Trek The Next Generation, which rejuvenated Star Trek, redefined it, and kicked off a run of 18 consecutive years with at least one Star Trek TV series in production, and ultimately yielded a total of four TV series plus six feature films, an era which is known to many fans, especially those of us who were watching at the time, as the golden age of Star Trek. Since the Star Trek franchise is currently in the early years of another potential golden age, with three live-action streaming series and two animated series currently in production, plus more series and another movie in development, I thought it might be worth looking back at the show that inspired that earlier golden age in order to answer the question, what can the creators of new Star Trek actually learn from TNG? If we look back at the state of the Star Trek franchise around the time Paramount Pictures began developing Star Trek The Next Generation, we see that it was the ideal moment to take a chance on this kind of expansion. The Star Trek movie series was humming along nicely. Star Trek II was a critical and commercial success, breathing life back into the franchise after the expensive and, to many, underwhelming Star Trek The Motion Picture. Star Trek III came along two years later and was less successful, but also mostly well-received. And then in 1986, the year before TNG's television premiere, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, became the highest-grossing Star Trek movie ever, a title it would hold until the first of the films in the rebooted series opened in 2009. Remember, 1986 was 20 years after Star Trek premiered on TV, and yet, two decades in, it seemed to be just now hitting its stride. It was establishing itself as the kind of property studio executives dream about, a series that had been successful on both TV and at the movies with a dedicated fan base and the potential to grow its audience well beyond that fan base, as had just happened with Star Trek IV. Paramount wanted to bring Star Trek back to TV. Makes sense. But the way they and Gene Roddenberry, who signed on to create the show, decided to do it was relatively unique and more than a little risky. Hiring the original Star Trek cast to star in the show wasn't an option. Thanks to the success of the films, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy's services were deemed to be too expensive for a weekly television series. They could have centered the new show on the same established characters, but simply recast them with more affordable actors. It had been done before. Probably the most successful example would be M.A.S.H., and has been done quite a few times in the years since TNG debuted. Alien Nation, Stargate SG-1, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Starman in the Heat of the Night, and numerous other shows aired on TV throughout the 1980s and 90s that centered on characters first established in movies played by new actors. Some, like Buffy and Stargate, went on to become far more successful than the films that spawned them, some, like Starman or the TV versions of Ferris Bueller and Bill and Ted, didn't catch on and were immediately forgotten. But the point is, it had been done. It would be done. Paramount could have done that with Star Trek, but chose not to. 
Instead, Roddenberry and his team of writers and producers chose to make their new show about a group of characters who lived in the same fictional universe and worked on a ship with the same name, but otherwise had no direct connections to the original version of Star Trek. We're used to this sort of thing nowadays, because it's been done so often, largely due to the success of TNG, but think about how much of a chance they were taking at the time. Roddenberry and his employers at Paramount were betting on the success of a show that had nothing in common with its parent series other than the title and the general premise. Remember, before TNG, Star Trek was a TV show that ran for three seasons and four movies, all centered on Kirk and Spock and that original crew, and that's it. That's what Star Trek was. The creators of TNG had no way of knowing if fans would accept a new show starring new actors playing new characters serving aboard a new Enterprise. And actually, for the first two years or so, a lot of the fans didn't accept it. The show wasn't canceled during those difficult early years, so it wasn't a bomb, but it didn't exactly light the world on fire right away either. TNG took a few seasons to not only find its audience, but also to find itself its voice, what made it different from the original Star Trek, but also a worthy successor to it. Once that happened, TNG became one of the most successful TV series of its time. As Paramount had hoped, its influence reached well beyond the dedicated Star Trek fanbase. It became a cultural touchstone, recognizable even to people who didn't watch it. Its characters became just as well-known as their predecessors in the original series. It had a significant impact on the TV industry, especially here in the U.S. It proved that first-run syndication was a viable outlet for shows, opening up opportunities for original programming beyond the four major TV networks and paving the way for shows like Baywatch, Hercules, and Xena, and Babylon 5. Its success also led to a flurry of other projects that sought to revive established properties through the Next Generation model, resulting in titles like Bonanza the Next Generation, Knight Rider 2010, and Team Knight Rider, and my personal favorite, Kung Fu The Legend Continues, which starred David Carradine as the grandson of his character in the original Kung Fu, who reunites with his estranged son Peter, now a police officer, to fight crime on the mean streets of a city that we are told is not Toronto, but definitely is Toronto. Aside from their regular routine of chasing down murderers and drug dealers, facing off against the occasional shadow assassin, and teaching important life lessons to local teens, Kane and Peter also occasionally indulge in a bit of time travel, including one such adventure where they journey back to an ancient Shaolin temple and wind up inventing Kung Fu by teaching it to the monks. Isn't that neat? Star Trek. Right. It seems to me that if we consider it in terms of both its basic premise and the show it eventually grew into, Star Trek The Next Generation has at least three important lessons to teach the creators of the current era of Star Trek. First lesson, be independent. Well, be relatively independent, considering that your show still exists within the larger framework of Star Trek. Like I said, and as I'm sure most of you know already, there are no connections between the original Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation beyond the fact that both shows take place in the same universe, and they both take place on ships named Enterprise. TNG's first season takes place roughly a hundred years after Classic Trek's first season, and none of the characters has anything to do with any of the characters from TOS. There is a cameo by DeForest Kelly as an ancient Dr. McCoy in TNG's pilot episode to pass the baton and let any dubious fans in the audience know that, yes, this new show was an official approved part of Star Trek, not some unauthorized (laughs) outlaw production. But that's one scene in the very first episode. The TNG crew doesn't encounter another character from Classic Trek until Season 3, when Sarek shows up. And it's not as though Sarek was ever anything approaching a main character. They don't encounter another regular from Classic Trek until Season 5, 
when Spock appears in the Unification two-parter, and the only time they run into another TOS regular after that is the following season when Scotty beams in for relics. Until Captain Kirk himself, along with Scotty and Chekhov, comes in to collect a quick paycheck for the movie Star Trek Generations, that is, but that's not until after the TV series. The lack of close connections or direct references to classic Trek allowed TNG to claim its own territory within the franchise. Yes, it was Star Trek. Yes, it benefited from that brand recognition, but it succeeded on its own terms. It found its own unique identity, and its fans, whether they were also fans of classic Trek or not, enjoyed it for its own merits. People watched and liked TNG because it was a good show in its own right not because it attached itself to the original series like a barnacle on the bottom of a ship. A sea ship, not a starship. Do starships collect barnacles? Are baryon particles the equivalent? Whatever. Anyway, compare the relative independence of TNG from Classic Trek to the current crop of shows. In Star Trek Discovery, lead protagonist Michael Burnham is Spock's adopted sister, who receives occasional visits from Sarek and Amanda. Season 1 of Discovery also features a guest appearance from recurring TOS antagonist Harry Mudd. Season 2 of Discovery features both Spock himself and Captain Christopher Pike, Kirk's predecessor as commander of the TOS Enterprise, as regular characters. Star Trek Picard is kind of an obvious one. It centers on the lead protagonist of TNG, Jean-Luc Picard, once again played by Patrick Stewart, has featured guest appearances by other TNG cast members reprising their characters, and in its upcoming third season will apparently feature the entire TNG crew returning for one final, swear to God, this time they're not kidding, adventure. And of course, it also features Seven of Nine as a regular. The two animated shows currently in production have both featured multiple appearances by characters from past Trek shows, and Star Trek Prodigy includes a hologram of Star Trek Voyager's Captain Janeway, voiced by Kate Mulgrew, among its regular cast. And most recently, Star Trek Strange New Worlds is set aboard the same Enterprise commanded by Kirk in TOS only a decade earlier, with Captain Pike in command of a crew that also includes Spock, Uhura, and Nurse Chapel from TOS, along with Number One, who, like Pike, was introduced in the original unaired TOS pilot. In its first season finale, Strange New Worlds also featured James T. Kirk himself, who will apparently be making further appearances in Season 2. Now, let me be clear, none of that means that the new shows are automatically bad. Some of them, particularly Strange New Worlds and Discovery when it's at its best, have been excellent. I'm not pointing out all these connections to previous shows as a way of arguing that the new shows necessarily suck. They haven't sucked, for the most part. I'm just making note of how closely they've attached themselves in certain ways to other parts of the franchise, while TNG didn't really do that. And I am suggesting, despite having liked a lot of the new stuff, that maybe when the time comes to develop the next new Star Trek show, the creators should follow the example of TNG and leave the training wheels off. Make a show set aboard a new ship with new characters who have no relationships to anyone from one of the previous series, and few, or better yet, no guest appearances from legacy characters. It worked for TNG, and back then the creators of TNG didn't even have that much assurance because they didn't have any examples to prove that a Star Trek show like TNG could work, since they hadn't created TNG yet. But then they created TNG, which demonstrated that a show like TNG which in this context would now actually mean a show not like TNG, could work. Does that work? Second lesson, be innovative. Don't just play with the toys that are already in the toy box. Bring in some new toys. In fact, bring in new toys and then mostly just play with those. Yes, 
TNG did make use of certain elements of the Star Trek universe that had been introduced in the original series. The Romulans were recurring antagonists, and the Klingons returned as well, only this time as problematic allies rather than outright enemies. But Look at all the new stuff the creators of TNG came up with for their characters to contend with. Q, a trickster god-like character who is reminiscent of Trelane, who appeared in one TOS episode, but who, thanks to the charisma and comedic timing of John Delancey and his chemistry with Patrick Stewart, became one of the most important recurring characters in TNG. The Borg. Though they were eventually overused and drained of their menace, when the Borg were introduced in TNG's second season, they were immediately the most formidable and threatening alien species the franchise had ever seen. A mysterious, cybernetically enhanced race from an unexplored part of the galaxy, the Borg were not only seemingly impossible to defeat or even escape from at first, they were also something rare among Star Trek aliens. Truly alien. Again, at first. Initially described as being a hive mind made up of billions of individuals with no gender, no individuality, and no leadership hierarchy, over the years the Borg would be watered down until eventually they became just another bunch of people with shit glued to their faces. But TNG isn't to blame for most of that, and... When they first showed up to challenge Captain Picard and the Enterprise, they were like nothing seen in Star Trek before. The Cardassians. These reptilian space Nazis would go on to become major antagonists on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, but they were introduced on TNG as adversaries of the Federation from a recently concluded off-screen war. Those were the days, weren't they? when a Star Trek show could just write a never-before-mentioned recent war with a never-before-seen alien into its fourth season. The Cardassians combined the military prowess of the Klingons with the calculating intellect of the Romulans, but they, or at least their overtly fascist government, seemed to lack the more honorable qualities of either, which made them fearsome and compelling foes. TNG did more than create new villains. It also introduced the holodeck, though a similar technology called the Recreation Room had previously appeared in Star Trek, the animated series, and with it, the concept of the holodeck episode, both of which went on to become staples of the franchise for the next 15 years, which wasn't always such a great thing, but still, innovation. Another TNG innovation was to tinker with the classic Star Trek formula a bit. For example, while classic Trek had Captain Kirk himself frequently leaving the ship to command away missions, on TNG, that was the job of the first officer, Commander Riker. Captain Picard mostly remained on the Enterprise, creating a division of labor that played to the strengths of both characters. Picard being the thoughtful, scholarly diplomat, while Riker was the quick-thinking and decisive man of action. TNG also shifted Star Trek toward a more character-based kind of storytelling. It's not that classic Trek didn't have any character-driven episodes. It did. But most TOS episodes were primarily plot-driven. Enterprise shows up at a planet that has a problem. Kirk and his crew struggle to solve the problem. They eventually do. They leave. The end and the focus of the story is on the problem and how they're trying to solve it. TNG has plenty of episodes like that too, but it also takes a much deeper and more frequent interest in the personal lives and histories of its regulars. Worf's difficulty in reconciling his Klingon heritage with his human upbringing becomes important to several episodes throughout the series and is even at the center of the two-parter that bridges seasons four and five. Android Data's aspirations to attain humanity are far more than a character quirk to distinguish him from the rest of the supporting cast. They are at the heart of some of the show's best episodes. And following Captain Picard's rescue from the Borg at the start of Season 4, the show devotes an entire episode to the crew taking some time off on Earth to visit family and recover. There's no big problem to solve. There's no threat to the ship. It's basically just an hour of character work. It's difficult to imagine classic Trek ever producing such an episode. Third lesson. Look ahead, not behind. 
One question I get asked from time to time by fellow Trekkies, especially when there's a new show or a new season of a show coming up, is what planets are you hoping to get to see again? Or what classic characters would you like to see show up? And my answer is always the same. None of them. I don't want the new shows to bring back the old stuff. I want the new shows to do new stuff. Admittedly, this was a lot easier for Star Trek The Next Generation to do back in 1987 than it is for new Trek shows to do today. The toy chest is much bigger now, and there are a lot more toys in there to play with. And even though its pull on me isn't very strong, I do understand the temptation. A lot more Star Trek has been established since TNG began. We've explored so many strange new worlds, sought out so much in the way of new life and new civilizations, that it's tempting for the creators of new Star Trek, particularly if they are longtime fans of the franchise, to return us to places we've gone before, rather than doing the opposite of that. But, and this is just my subjective opinion, although keep in mind that I am right about this. It's not a storyteller's job to act as a tour guide through the established lore. It's a storyteller's job to tell stories. And for Star Trek, a franchise that began with a TV series that literally started every episode with to boldly go where no one has gone before as its mission statement, that should mean taking the characters to new places. If not new to them, at least new to us in the audience. For the most part, Star Trek The Next Generation did this. With one early and unfortunate exception, Season 1's The Naked Now, a reprise of Classic Trek's The Naked Time, TNG didn't produce sequels to Classic Trek episodes. It spent its time telling its own stories centered on its own characters, not covering the greatest hits or tying up loose ends left behind by its predecessor. One way the creators of TNG made it easy for their show to look forward rather than backward was by setting their show a hundred years after Classic Trek. But I want to stress that it's not necessary to do that in order to put this lesson into practice. It doesn't matter if a show is set prior to TOS, like Enterprise, Strange New Worlds, or the first two seasons of Discovery, or set almost a thousand years after TOS, like Discovery beginning with its third season. The setting doesn't matter nearly as much as the stories you tell in that setting. Star Trek is fiction. Its settings are just as imaginary as its characters and its plots. So if you create a Star Trek show that takes place around the same time as Classic Trek, that doesn't mean you have to do an episode where your characters visit the same gangster planet or run afoul of Romulans or find themselves knee-deep in their own troubles with Tribbles. If you create a show that takes place around the same time as the last few seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, that doesn't mean you have to make your show about the Dominion War. It's a big galaxy. There must be lots of other stuff going on. So make some of it up instead of doing a retread of stuff we've already seen. Because of how closely tied many of their main characters are to previous shows in the franchise, you might think that the worst results to come from ignoring this lesson belong to the new Trek series. And there are definitely a few examples of the new shows choosing to their detriment to borrow from one of the old shows instead of trying to create something on their own. But for me, the most illustrative examples of looking behind rather than ahead come from Star Trek Voyager. To their credit, for the first couple of seasons, the producers of Voyager tried to create their own original foils for Captain Janeway and her crew, but when the likes of the Kazon and the Vidians failed to capture the audience's imagination, the producers threw up their hands and said, fuck it, let's just do Q and the Borg. And so Q and the Borg both went from being Captain Picard villains to Captain Janeway villains. The transplantation of Q from TNG to Voyager is a lesser offense, because he only winds up appearing in three episodes. It's the use of the Borg that is the real problem. The Borg ultimately appear in nearly four times as many Voyager episodes as TNG episodes, not counting episodes where Seven of Nine is the only Borg present, that is. And their Voyager appearances are underwhelming at best. 
By the end of the series, the Borg, a nearly unstoppable existential threat in their earliest TNG appearances, have been reduced to a recurring annoyance. Sometimes when I suggest that maybe Voyager overused the Borg just a tad, again, four times as many Borg episodes on Voyager as on TNG, a fan will say, oh, but Steve, TNG established that the Borg are from the Delta Quadrant, and Voyager takes place in the Delta Quadrant, so the producers had to use the Borg as a frequent antagonist. My response to this argument is fairly simple and goes a little something like this. No, they didn't. Because, see, there are no Borg, there is no Voyager, and there is no Delta Quadrant. It's all made up. That being the case, the writers of Star Trek Voyager didn't have to make up so many episodes featuring the Borg, or in fact, any episodes featuring the Borg. They could have just left the Borg out. And if they really had a problem with not using the Borg, despite setting the show in the region of space TNG had previously established the Borg as being from, they could have made up an excuse for why our heroes weren't running into the Borg and had a character say that excuse in an episode, and then it wouldn't have been a problem anymore. One more thing. Just as it isn't a storyteller's job to be a tour guide through the lore, it also isn't a storyteller's job to patch up inconsistencies and rough spots in the canon left behind by past storytellers. Star Wars has developed a really bad habit of doing this, but thankfully Star Trek has mostly avoided it. Mostly. To the best of my recollection, TNG never did it, a fact for which I am grateful. For example, TNG spent a bit of time over the course of its seven years letting us get to know the Klingons through Worf and various guest characters, but it never wasted an episode or even a scene explaining how Worf managed to get his hands on Kang's sash from the Day of the Dove, for example. I never felt that required an explanation, but if it did, they reused a prop, does the job just fine. Plus, making a sash worn by a Klingon who appeared on the original series a part of the costume of the Klingon character on your new spinoff show 20 years later is the sort of thing that works best as kind of a meta Easter egg. If you don't notice it, it doesn't matter. If you do, you think, oh, neat. And then hopefully the show gives you something more important to be interested in. TNG also didn't bother explaining why Worf's forehead ridges look different beginning in Season 2, or why Klingons in general look different in the movies and TNG than they did in TOS. It was Star Trek Enterprise that wasted two episodes of its final season explaining that thing that demanded no explanation. Good thing that sort of gratuitous pandering to the most pedantic members of the audience didn't become common practice in popular storytelling after that, huh? <laughs> Again, as with the first lesson, I'm not arguing that every single time a newer show revisits something from an older show, it's automatically bad. Deep Space Nine did an episode where the heroes literally revisited an episode of classic Trek, Trials and Tribulations, where Captain Sisko and crew are forest gumped into the trouble with Tribbles, and that turned out pretty well. It's a fun, clever episode. Voyager's first Q episode is one of its best. Enterprise does a Borg episode that is likewise one of the best episodes it ever did. The first season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds utilized the Gorn as a recurring antagonist, albeit in a retconned form, and its season finale is an alternate timeline version of the classic Trek episode Balance of Terror, which includes several shots and lines of dialogue lifted directly from the original, and it all works pretty well. My point isn't, don't ever do this or else your show will suck. My point is, this sort of thing is best done carefully and rarely, if at all. The most important thing the newer Star Trek shows can learn from TNG, the broader point contained in each of the three lessons I've just been talking about, is to establish their own identity. Like I said earlier in this video and have said many times elsewhere, I have enjoyed a lot of the new stuff. After kind of a rough first season, Discovery has grown into a very good, though not perfect, series. 
the animated series Star Trek Prodigy, which is the one I expected to like the least going in, since it's specifically aimed at children, has been excellent so far, and Strange New Worlds just had the best first season of any Star Trek show in almost 30 years, if not longer. So the franchise seems to be in good hands. And yet, even as I watch and enjoy much of the new Star Trek being produced today, when I see what a tight grip it maintains on what came before, I can't help but admire the courage of the creators of TNG who took the chance of making something new, something different, something largely detached from what had come before. Hopefully, now that they've found their balance, when it comes time to develop the next new project under the banner of Star Trek, the creators will find a bit of that courage, take off the training wheels, and really take their and our imaginations for a ride. The show doesn't need to include legacy characters or new characters who are relatives of legacy characters. It doesn't need to be set on a ship we've seen before. It doesn't need to revisit familiar places. It can be what TNG was, what TNG became, a new Star Trek, a different Star Trek, a show that broadens our concept of what Star Trek is and is capable of being. It can be whatever you make it. So, make it. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Tawodi Elohi. I googled it. I think that's how it's pronounced. Apologies if it's not. Thanks, Tawodi Elohi. Joe Goes Over. Thanks, Joe. Chad Troftgruben. Thanks, Chad. William C., thanks William. Tibernut Null, thanks Tibernut. Next, new channel members. There's only one this time. Jason Pilath, thank you, Jason. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the five bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead Ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge five dollars a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift rather than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. And now to next month's regulation trek actually topic it's a topic that i've placed in the polls every so often for the past couple of years and it's finally come out on top and i'm super excited about it because this is going to be fun it's a topic that will allow us to examine one of the many gaps in star trek's fictional history how some writers and artists sought to fill that gap and how they had to really use their imaginations as they scrambled to make their filler match the other side of the gap. If you know what I'm talking about, what I just said makes sense. If you don't, well, after next month, you will, because we're going to answer the question, what actually happened between Star Trek III and Star Trek IV? That's going to be a good one. See you then. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.